Brewing sake is about learning the nature of the region. The main part of the brewing process happens in winter. The north winds wait for no man. So, hop to it! Father! Huh? Uh, coming! Sake is a rice wine that has rich historical and cultural significance in Japan. It is often called Nihonshu to avoid confusion with general alcohol, which is what sake refers to in Japanese. Today, there are still many local breweries that carry on traditional ways of making sake, while also incorporating new machinery to make the process more efficient and precise. And thanks to the Japanese Tax Bureau, we will be exploring an inside look at how both Japanese sake as well as umeshu, aka plum wine, are made. First, we'll learn about how the process of making sake is very precise, requiring careful adjustments, ingredients, and conditions that need to be met in order to produce high quality sake. We'll also taste test some of the freshest and purest sake available on the market. In addition, we'll learn how to make our very own umeshu and gain some insights into plum wine making. Finally, we'll try to unravel the biggest question of all. Why is this educational animation called Kanpai not more well known? Because seriously, this stuff is high quality Hi. content. Oh, uh, Kanpai to you. Oh, yeah. Today's tour starts in a small town just outside of Watayama City called Kainan, where we will be walking through one of the local breweries of potentially the most famous local sake, Kuroshi. In fact, I had heard about this sake early on when I came to Watayama, and I've tried some before as well. But let's see how it tastes straight from the brewery itself. After we donned the official garb of the workers, Representative Director Nate walked us through the process of how sake is made at Nate Brewery. First, the rice is carefully polished, and this initial step is critical at determining the flavor and aroma profile. Rice that is polished up to 50% of its outer surface is generally considered higher quality and is more expensive. The sake that is produced from this rice is called Dai Ginjo Shu. Dai meaning great and Ginjo being a general term to refer to high quality sake. So basically, it just means very good sake. And then Shu meaning alcohol. In fact, the more the rice is polished, the stronger the aroma and more delicate the flavor of the sake. Rice that is only polished by 40% produces sake called Ginjoshu, and rice that is 30% polished produces sake called Honjozo, which means pure brewed sake. The ratio of polishing is referred to as polishing rate, indicating how much of the rice grain is left after polishing. So Honjozo would have a polishing rate of 70%, because that is how much of the original rice grain is left after polishing. It's no surprise then why Dai Din Joshu is the most expensive, since only 50% of the rice grain is used for the sake making process. After polishing, the rice is left in a drying state for about two to three weeks to stabilize the moisture content. Next, the rice must be washed and soaked to further remove impurities and increase the moisture content. Again, this is a very delicate process, and the water used can drastically affect the flavor of the sake. Every second of the soaking process matters. One second more or less can drastically change the flavor. Water that is harder gives it a sharper and drier taste. Hard water is suitable for sake brewing because its high mineral contents can accelerate the fermentation. But hard water makes the fermentation finish quickly, thus it doesn't produce that tanre or that smooth and refreshing taste and aroma in the final sake. So Nate Brewery makes their sake with slightly hard water to bring out the smooth taste while still having strong fermentation. Think of it like the best of both worlds. After soaking, the rice is steamed with a machine called a koshiki, basically a glorified rice steamer that uniformly steams the rice. I easily go through about two cups of rice per day, but this amount of rice is on a different level entirely. After steaming, the rice goes through a four-day process that has three stages to make the moromi, or the rice mash. 
On the first day, the steamed rice is combined with water, yeast starter, and a tea ingredient that is unique to sake called toji, which is chut rice that is inoculated with Aspergillus oryzae. Hopefully that's how you say it. Basically, it's a mold that releases a special enzyme that breaks down the complex carbohydrates into sugars through saccharification. Koji is also used in many other Japanese ingredients, like soy sauce and miso. The second day is simply time for the yeast to cultivate. And on the third day, more steamed rice, water, and koji are added. The fourth day is also the same as the third, so the amount of sake just slowly increases with each stage. This freshly made moromi is then allowed to ferment for a month at low temperatures. Mm. I want to say the bubbles, be careful. <laughs> if you uh, fall something. <laughs> <laughs> After fermentation, the moromi is pressed into a special machine to separate the raw sake or the liquid and also the sake lease, the solid. This unprocessed sake is then filtered, pasteurized, and stored and aged until it's ready to be bottled and shipped. However, we were lucky enough to try special namazake, which is unpasteurized sake, so it must be refrigerated and consumed quickly. During the taste testing, we were presented with three different kinds of sake. The namazake in the form of junmai kuroshi, the local sake without any added alcohol, junmai kuroshi that was pasteurized, and the famed junmai daidinjo. So I've already talked about daidinjo, and how it's just special grade sake. But that junmai is also very important if you go about buying sake, because it means that the sake has no added alcohol. So basically it is the sake in its purest form, and is definitely the highest quality sake that you can buy. So if you go around and you wanna impress your friends when you buy sake, look for junmai, and also look for that dai dinjo to get the highest quality sake. My favorites were definitely the dai dinjo and namazate but I think the Dai Dinjo goes down the best and is definitely the most refreshing. The main difference that I noticed was that the Kuroshi had a nice fruitier flavor profile and perhaps even a sweeter taste. Yeah, the profile is 15 The profile. It's very... Explain that the profile is. It's very smooth. Like, probably the smoothest one yet. It's a little sweeter than the one on the left. It has more of a... In my opinion, it has more of a plum flavor. Like, the, the left didn't have, like, that plum flavor. I feel like this one has. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I like the left one more. Like the, more. the first one. The first one? Yeah. Really? Oh. You like it better? Then again, this is my second one. <laughs> yeah, the second one tastes better every the, time, uh, right? <laughs> What I was really surprised by though was the drastic difference between the raw kuroshi and the pasteurized kuroshi, as their flavors were very distinct from each other. The raw or namazate kuroshi definitely had that fruitier flavor, even when compared to the pasteurized kuroshi. All right, here we go. Why do you have a microphone? Are you recording all of this? Yeah, recorded. Your voice is on there too. Oh no, that, that's how they're gonna find me. After departing from the Nate Brewery, we headed all the way down to Tanabe to visit a local Umeshu brewery, Nakata Shokuhin, where we would see where the Umeshu is made and bottled as well as make our very own Umeshu through a very simple process that you can even do at home, which is really quite easy with the right ingredients, using a sealable container, frozen plums, Distilled Japanese white liquor or shochu or vodka as substitute options. And if you have them, the star shaped candies called. It's so pretty. How do you feel about yours? Do you feel like it's good coverage? Mm. No. <laughs> In any case, after finishing making our umeshu, we bottled it up, slapped a sticker on, and then we put it away for storage for about three months, or longer depending on how long you want to brew it. After that, we saw some lovely factory workers inspecting the freshly bottled umeshu and labeling it to be shipped to happy customers, or depressed ones that want to forget their sorrows. <laughs> 
Finally, we tried probably 15 different types of plum wines, some with various additions like honey or that delicious Japanese fruit jelly. Dr. Jenny. After thanking our host, we departed and ended with one of the biggest surprises, a rare gem of an animation called Kanpai that really exemplifies what a good educational video should strive to be. Egg sake is nice, but fresh sake is pretty tasty too. Oh yeah? I'd love to try some of that. <laughs> I figured that as much. <laughs> It had everything from being informative, having humor, and even romance, to a deeply passionate story about the importance of traditions and cultural heritage. You give the brewery some serious thought. <sighs> this again? What do you mean again? Listen! Maintaining a brewery is about conservation. We must protect the natural beauty of our home. It is our legacy. I told you before. I will decide my own future. How dare you! Darling, please, not in front of our guest. Mm. Okay, so that'll be it for this tour video. I hope you found some joy from watching and learned some new information. And if you do want to try some sake in the future, which I highly recommend, I suggest you try some of this sake with that Wakayama seal of approval. Anyway, that'll be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone, and I'll catch you in the next one. Goodbye! Ha, 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 ha.